In this uh, video, we're going to discuss directory services for Unix and Linux. Specifically, we're going to talk about how to use uh, Network Information Service, or NIS, and Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, or LDAP, in Unix or Linux. So a brief introduction to uh, directory services. So the two, that, again, that we're going to talk about are NIS and LDAP. And overall, these support using Linux as a network operating system. For those of you that may be familiar with older network operating systems like Novell or newer ones like Active Directory with Microsoft Windows, this would allow similar functionality to what you would find with, uh, with things like Active Directory. Of course, you know, with Linux, we can get most of the functionality that we would have with Active Directory with a few exceptions. Things like group policy, there really is no good analog for. But for a lot of the other functionality that we would need, we can certainly do that with Linux. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that you would that you would use it for. So it enables the sharing of data, users, groups, security applications, and other network functions, uh, typically on a private LAN. And that's from Wikipedia. So if you look up a network operating system on Wikipedia, that is the generic definition of a network operating system. And if you think about something like Microsoft Active Directory, the things that it allows you to use uh, you know, within one network, you have... Um, uh, obviously, access to files and resources, which are managed through things like Active Directory. Uh, authentication is managed through Active Directory. And the same with older platforms like Novell. So if I have a central repository, I mean, let's think about how this helps us. If I have a central repository for things like user accounts, I don't have to manage those in multiple locations. So in any decent-sized network, it's, it's almost a foregone conclusion that you're going to have to have some kind of directory services running, whether it be Windows or Linux. And what I'll talk about later on is in a typical scenario, you're really not going to have um, Linux probably being an equivalent to an Active Directory server uh, like Microsoft Windows, mostly because of things like group policy. However, if you're running something like group, like uh, Windows with Active Directory and so forth, you probably want all of your machines in your network to be able to use its directory services to do lookups for, um, for various information on the network. So. LDAP as a client in Linux allows us to do that. So it allows us to integrate with uh, something like Active Directory. So we're going to talk about that in more detail. NIS, on the other hand, uh, not so much. So, so again, the, the big key, uh, key concept here is shared resources and centralized management so we can manage things uh, centralized. Um, so before I go too deep into this, though, I think it's important for us to take a look at you know, what our world would look like if we didn't have these things. All right, so let's talk about the, uh, the good old days. So if you had a network in the old days you, and you didn't have some kind of central management, so let's say you had a network. Uh, we'll, have, we'll say we have three computers. We'll call one the Whopper, the other one uh, Coleco, and the other one Imsay. So if I had those three machines and I wanted to keep track of IP addresses for those three machines, for example, we already learned about the host file. So if I go into Whopper and I set up a host file, um, so this way I can just type in the host name Coleco and I'll get the 10.0.0.30. Uh, so we've, we've talked about how that works. Uh, I could do that. And then I could take that same file and I could copy it to my other machines. So I could copy it to Coleco and Imsay, um, which is all well and good. But what happens if I need to change something? So let's say I have to change the IP address of the Whopper. Um, well, now I have to go and take that file and copy it to... Uh, several other machines, right, to the other two machines. This is not a big deal when we only have a couple machines, but obviously if we have a lot of machines, we're going to have a lot of files to update every single time we have a change of a file. And this is just one example. This is just the host file. Uh, you know, imagine if we had to update all those other files that we, uh, that we use that have configuration information that might be useful to share or centrally manage on our network. And if you had to go around and keep all this stuff updated and all your servers and all your machines... Uh, your workday would look pretty much like this, right? You'd be so tired, just be sleeping in the conference room. Although <laughs> some of us do that anyway, right? Um, so there's a better way, and we've learned about this, right? And I think most of you are familiar with this. You know, how do we centralize the management of host names on our network? Well, of course, we we don't use host files. We bypass that and use a centralized domain name system or DNS server. So that DNS server keeps all of the IP address and host names uh, in a file, you know, or in a in a little database. And we query that using the, uh, the local area network. And of course, this is also used on the internet as well. So that's how we get host names on the internet. It's the same protocol. But the point is, we've managed to centrally um, um, 
to, to essentially locate DNS so that, or this idea of looking up a host name so that we're not maintaining that over the entire network. So we do the same thing with something like NIS or LDAP. NIS or LDAP is to centrally manage other things. Now, I will tell you that NIS could centrally manage the host file. So you could use it in place of, uh, of DNS, just like in Microsoft Windows, you can use things like NetBIOS in place of DNS. But as they'll probably tell you in the Microsoft world, and, and I'll tell you here in the Linux world, it's generally not a good idea to do that. DNS is a very robust service. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's, it's, it's pretty reliable. And it works great on large networks, so there's no reason not to use that. But if you wanted to, you could, just like with Active Directory, you could use NetBIOS and things like that. So let's talk about using NIS or LDAP. So normally what we use it for, uh, specifically NIS and or LDAP, is user authentication. That's the big one. So it allows us, in both cases, it allows us to centrally manage user authentication on our network. Um, in the case of NIS, it's also periodically used to keep your email aliases in sync. So you can keep your email aliases centrally managed as well. But I think by and large, most people use these technologies for user authentication. Um, DNS can be used, but again, as I said before, with NIS, it, it's probably a better idea to use DNS. It's easy to install, it's easy to set up. We did that in other labs in this course. So by all means, I would recommend using DNS over using NIS, but it is available, it's an option. And there are other things that we can share as well with, DN with NIS, um, which I'm gonna talk about later on. So NIS, it's important to note, only works in Linux and Unix. So you cannot use NIS if you're planning on integrating with a Windows network. So if you have Microsoft Windows servers and you wanna integrate with those with Active Directory or something like that, uh, NIS is not gonna be a good option for you. However, something like LDAP would be a good option because that's supported by just about everything. It's an open standard, it's been around for a long time. Um, a lot of components that you find in Active Directory will look familiar to you if you're familiar with Active Directory when we talk about LDAP. A lot of it works very similar, but more importantly, Active Directory is compatible with LDAP. So there are, you can enable LDAP support on an Active Directory server so that we can query an, uh, a using LDAP from a Linux machine. And again, I'll talk about that more later on. So let's go ahead and start talking about NIS. Um, so it was originally developed by Sun Microsystems for Solaris, which of course now is Oracle, but Solaris was a Unix platform. I've talked about it before. The, uh, the Dunk server at Drexel University is Solaris, if you've used that. Um, the Yellow Pages, so originally it was called Yellow Pages, or YP, but Solaris or Sun had to change the name to NIS because obviously somebody already owns the trademark for Yellow Pages. I think it's uh, uh, either Bell or, or British Telecom, I can't remember, but one of those big phone companies already owns the Yellow Pages, so they had to change it. But Remember that it's the yellow pages because number one, it's a good conceptual model, right? It's um, you know it's a place where we can go look things up. It's a directory service, right? Directories are where you can look things up. But second, a lot of the stuff that we work with is uh, still called YP. So you'll see a lot of the stuff that we install is YP something. The tools are YP something. So if you see YP, you know it's for NIS. NIS Plus is briefly discussed in the textbook. It's really not used much anymore. It was developed much later um, than NIS, uh, but it had some issues. It kind of sucked. It was hard to install, hard to configure. Uh, it didn't really give us a lot of additional functionality compared to the original NIS. It did add some security, um, but if you're on a LAN, sometimes that those security concerns aren't as acute. Uh, so no one really uses it, um, not even Solaris. It was removed from Solaris. So they developed it for Solaris and they removed it. So that ought to tell you something about NAS+. Plus. Uh, so generally, we don't really use that, and we don't really talk about it in this course. LDAP is much more common than NIS. Uh, so I just feel like I should mention that now, that, uh, that certainly you'll see LDAP more, more commonly uh, than NIS. And again, it's because of the interoperability with Windows. So NIS can centrally manage things. If I were to ask you, <clears throat> you know, when I showed you that first example with the host file, the host file is in the Etsy directory, but there are lots of other files in the Etsy directory that we could centrally manage using NIS. So for example, your user accounts are stored in the password file. So that could be centrally managed. Uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna centrally manage the password file, which contains your user accounts, you might as well also do their passwords, which are in the shadow file, and also their groups. So you can also share the, uh, the group information and centrally manage that. You can centrally manage the host file, but as I said, 
We usually don't recommend doing that. Uh, DNS is a better option for that. You can centrally manage your services file. And if you recall, services is where all your port numbers are stored. So uh, that's your mapping of protocol name to port number. For example, HTTP maps to port 80. HTTPS goes to port 443. You can edit that file and centrally manage it if you wanted to with NIS. Same with the networks file, which is a list of, or a static list of all of your networks. Um, the RPC uh, file under Etsy, in theory, you can centrally manage that. Protocols file, which is the supported protocols. So for example, ICMP, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, TCP, UDP, and so forth and so on. Those are all examples of protocols. Now, a lot of these files are relatively uh, static. They don't change very often. Um, aliases, though, is one that would change frequently. So if you look at the list of files, I've underlined the ones that probably would be changing the most. Uh, the password file, the shadow file, and the aliases file, although arguably the groups file may also change a bit too. So if I were deciding which of these files I would want to centrally manage with NIS, I would probably choose the password and shadow files, and in addition, the aliases if I use my servers for email, my Linux servers. Um, the other ones, maybe not so much, like the host file, like I said, DNS is better at that. Services, networks, RPC, and protocols are relatively static. They're not going to be changed that much, and even if you do change them, they could be at the machine level. You don't really have to have that stuff centrally managed, but you could. It's certainly an option. We call these, by the way, each one of these things when you share them or when you centrally manage them with NIS, we call that creating a map. So when we say we're creating a map for password file or shadow file, that's what we're talking about. So setting up an NIS server, a couple of required packages. Uh, you'll need YP bind, um, which is the RPC port binding service. You're also going to need um, port map, which is uh, part of RPC. Uh, that's the RPC port mapping service. Just a little quick word about RPC and the way it works. I've talked about RPC before. Um, we've certainly installed some other services that use RPC. An example of uh, something that uses RPC would be NFS. So NFS also uses RPC, which stands for Remote Procedure Call. Um, basically, the way RPC works is it, it gives you a method for applications to communicate over the network, over TCP IP. So they can use TCP IP as a transport mechanism to call other programs that are running on other servers. RPC can also be used locally. So a lot of applications that have multiple components use RPC to communicate with, with these different components, even when they're installed on the same machine. The way it works, though, is when RPC starts, it binds to dynamic port numbers. So RPC doesn't always listen on a static port number. Uh, it, it automatically picks up. So every, every application is going to use RPC that binds to it. Um, that binds to RPC is going to get a dynamic port number. So uh, port map is what handles that. So when YP bind calls RPC to get a binding, port map is what assigns it a port number dynamically, and then it's using that port. So YP serve is the core NIS daemon. So that is the daemon that actually uh, uh, runs NIS. Uh, so that's the, the core service. YP tools is optional. Um, however, I would recommend installing it on any machine that you're going to use NIS because you might need some of those tools. For sure, you'll need them on clients. Um, I would guess that you would probably need them on the server as well. And we'll talk more about the uh, vernacular of these servers. But, uh, but that has a lot of the commands that I'm going to talk about. So I would just go ahead and install those. Uh, some examples are YP cat, YP password, YP witch. And again, we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. But there's a bunch of those YP commands. Not to be confused with YP password with that extra D on the end, that is a daemon which also has to be installed. This is what handles password and group lookups, uh, and it also does updates for you. So it's important to have that. When NIS makes an update, so if NIS does an update on, say, a password or a user account or something like that, we want to have that replicated to any slave servers. So I haven't talked about slaves and masters yet, but in NIS, you have a master server, so you always have one master that has the master copy of the database of user accounts and you know all those files that I talked about in Etsy. And it's um, you know it does build a little database, but it's uh, it's building that database from the password file, from the host file, and so forth. So when YP bind is started, it goes in, or when it initializes, it gets the contents of those files and uses that to build its little database. Uh, that it provides to slaves and uses for lookups from uh, NAS clients. So when an NAS client does a lookup, it's coming from that database. But the slaves, 
So even though you might have one master, you can have multiple slaves on your network. So clients can either query slaves or the master. Uh, depending on you know your network topology, it might make sense to have a slave at certain locations or something like that. The uh, slaves do not do updates. They only do um, queries against the master. So all the updates would have to happen against the master. However, uh, if you are going to do the updates, this service is helpful because it will speed up the updates that get pushed down to the slaves. So it's certainly one of the one of the packages that you're going to want on any uh, uh, system. Now, if you're doing this in the lab, you may not need YPX FRD uh, if you're not using a second machine as a slave, which we don't do in the lab. So for configuration, once you get all those packages installed that I just talked about, uh, first, just like every other uh, service that we install in the lab environment, uh, you'll find under the Etsy, under sysconfig network, there'll be a, uh, this is the uh, config file or one of the config files used by NIS. Uh, this one's going to be for specifying RPC ports for port binding. Why would you want to specify the ports? Well, if you have to run a firewall, then you'll need to specify the ports. You can't use a firewall if you're using dynamic ports because the firewall won't know what ports to allow. Um, so you would, of course, have to, to bind those ports. Uh, the other option is, you, you know, just, just harden your server and don't use a firewall. This should all be on your local area network anyway. You would not want this stuff mapped from the outside world to your firewall. You know, you wouldn't want people on the public internet being able to access your NIS server to do queries. Um, of course not, you know, that would expose things like our, our password hashes and things like that. Um, next, if you look in, uh, under Etsy, look for ypserve.conf. This is the main configuration file for, uh, for NIS. So you'll find a whole bunch of things in here. Um, they're, they're basically, it'll look like option colon value. So there'll be an option name and then a value. You can take a look at that and see what types of things you see in there. So for example, if you do this right now, if you pause the video and take a look at your ypserve.conf, you should see something that says trust and underscore master. And you can set that to the IP address of, um, of whoever the master is if you're on a slave. And of course, your, your first system would probably be the master. But if you were installing a slave, that's where you would configure the IP address uh, for where to get its updates from the master. Um, you can also restrict access to the shadow file, which is a good idea since the shadow file contains passwords. There's another config, uh, var yp secure nets. This allows you to basically disable subnets that you don't want querying uh, NIS. So for example, if you had a guest network and somebody had a, um, an NIS client in a guest network, you probably don't want them being able to do queries against NIS because again, they might be able to um, use brute force or something like that to figure out passwords in the network. There's also under var the, uh, the make file. Uh, not to be confused with make file, which we talk about for installing, you know, and building applications or compiling. But uh, this is used to create maps on initialization. So basically what this defines, if you recall, I, I showed you that list of all the different files we have in the Etsy directory. This is what sets which of those files in the Etsy directory are built into that database and synchronized or centrally managed. So, you know, you probably want to put the password file in there, the shadow file, um, and maybe the aliases. And if you were going to try doing this with host names, you would add the host file uh, and things like that. And if you recall, I did show you that list of the ones that it supports. So you define which maps to create. So once you have all that ready, once you set that in the make file, uh, you're ready to run the yp init command. The yp init command, when you run that on the master, uh, so you only run this really on the master, but on the, on the master, it gathers all the information found in those Etsy files that you defined in make file, and it builds that database that we talked about. On a slave, it copies the database from the master. So when you run yp init on a slave, it's going to go out to the master. It's going to get the, uh, the database contents and replicate it down to itself. So it'll be able to handle those, um, uh, those queries as a slave. Um, note that in the lab environment, if you're using a 64-bit system and you're using Fedora 15, um, then you're going to have to run the command from lib64. Uh, so you won't be able to just run YP in it. You'll have to run it from lib64. So if you're going to give that a try, you can pause the video now and go ahead and try it. But uh, make sure you use lib64 if you're on a 64-bit system. So once we get our server side running, now it's time to set up the NIS client. So this would be machines that are going to use NIS for authentication. So for example, when a user goes to log in to the Linux machine, rather than using its own password file uh, 
and its shadow file to authenticate the user. It bypasses that and goes to the server and queries from the server. It uses the server for that information. Um, so hence, it's centrally managed. So some required packages, very similar to before. You need YP bind for RPC. Uh, you need the YP tools, which have all the NAS tools in it, which, of course, you'll need to configure your client. Uh, and finally, RPC bind, of course, because we use RPC. So, um, so you'll need those three packages. If you install YP bind, it should automatically install RPC bind if it doesn't already exist on the client. And the YP tools you could also install. Once you do that, very similar to the server, same configuration files, really. You have etsy sysconfig network in that file. Uh, you'll be able to set your NAS domain. It's important to note that the NAS domain is not the same as a DNS domain. They don't have to be the same, although I suppose they could be uh, to keep things consistent, but they don't necessarily have to be the same. Uh, so don't just assume that your DNS domain is the same as your NIS domain. They could be different. Under etsyyp.conf, which we looked at before, uh, in there, you're going to set the IP address of the NIS server that this client is going to be querying for its authentication, for its host file, for its aliases, you know, whatever it is that you're centralizing. Uh, and that can be either a master or a slave. So you can set it to, uh, to any NIS server that's running. All right, so once you get that set up, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to go back to the slide real quick. This will probably be a good time to pause if you need to go and install these services on a client. Uh, and if you wanted to set up um, uh, these services. So once you have the client installed, so here's the problem that, that you might run into. Uh, let's say you're a user and you decide that it's time to change your password, which is a good thing, right? We want to periodically change our passwords. We like users to be able to change their passwords. So the user types PASSWD to change their password. It's going to work. So if you type PASSWD, on a client using NAS. It's gonna work, it's gonna update their password. Uh, the problem is it's only gonna change the local password. It's gonna change the local password file. So you can no longer use the PASSWD command to change your password. You have to use YP password, which is one of those YP tools that we talked about earlier. The YP password command is a little bit different than the password command. You have to pass it a switch for, for exactly what you wanna change. For example, the dash P switch tells you you wanna change your password. The dash L switch tells it you want to change your default shell. And dash F is to change your uh, uh, GECOS UID, which we don't really talk about in this course. Uh, but the other two are important. So if you wanted to change your shell or if you want to change your password, you would use either the dash P or the dash L command. Um, I should note, however, if you think about it, though, the one place where password will continue to work is on the master. So if you update your password on the master, you don't necessarily have to use the YP password command because it will update the password file on the master. And the next time you run YP in it, it's going to use that new version of the password because it's going to rebuild that database. Um, but because we know we can make changes to the files on the server side, any changes that get made there are going to replicate. So for example, if you wanted to add and remove users, you could continue to use the, uh, the user add and user del commands to add and remove users or to manage user accounts. Um, and that's just going to change the Etsy password file. Once the password file has been changed, you can use YP in it once again to reload that password file into the database and then have those changes replicate to the slaves. And then anytime an NAS client does a query, it's going to get the latest information in your password file from the master server. So you can use YP in it at any time that you need to make a change to a map from the master. So it doesn't necessarily have to be from the password file. So let's say you are using um, the host file. You are mapping the host file and centrally managing that. If you make a change to the host file, if you want to replicate that change, you simply run YP in it, and that change will be replicated. By the way, just taking a step back to changing password, uh, one thing you could do if you don't want your users uh, running PASSWD, you could do an alias that aliases uh, PASSWD to YP password and even puts the dash P on there. So by default, it's changing their password. Um, so that is an option. So if you wanted to make sure your users aren't trying to change their password, uh, but in reality only changing on their own, on the machine that they're logged into as opposed to on the master, you could do that. All right, so the LDAP uh, service. So LDAP is a little bit different than NIS. I talked about LDAP a little bit earlier before, but LDAP is basically a replacement to an older directory service called x.500. I haven't really talked about the term directory 
uh, services too much yet, but you can think of a directory service as a database with mostly static content. So when we say a directory, you can, you can substitute directory with database, and conceptually you'll understand what it does. It's basically a database of stuff. It's a database of objects that you periodically have to look up. So in uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora, we use Open LDAP. That's the package that we use by default if we're going to install LDAP. Uh, it uses the Sleepy Cat Berkeley database, which was developed by Oracle. It's owned by Oracle, uh, which, of course, is now Sun Microsystems. Um, kind of seeing a theme here, right? All this stuff is intellectual property of Sun. Uh, but here's the thing about Sleepy Cat Berkeley database. It is a hierarchical, not a relational database. So it's a little different than most databases that you might be familiar with. So most of us, when we think about databases, we think about rows and tables. But instead, with a hierarchical database, we think of objects. So it's more of an object type database. And I'm going to show you an example of that in just a second here. So let's take a look at an example. So let's say I have a network called Drexel. And I wanted to store all these different objects I have on the network. Well, the first thing we talk about in a hierarchical or an object database is an entry in LDAP. So in, in an entry in LDAP is um, basically a list of attributes um, that have values. So you can see in my example here, I might have a list of different attribute names. And those different attributes can have values. And by the way, you can have more than one attribute for those values. So for example, if one of the attributes was, let's say I'm defining a person here, and a person can have a phone number. I might have an attribute name of phone number, and the values could be multiple phone numbers, not just one. So I could list multiple phone numbers. If you've ever taken a database class, you might be familiar with this idea of normalization in a relational database. Those concerns go away in an object database. We don't have to do normalization. Now, something else that's a little bit different about a, uh, uh, a hierarchical or an object type database is, uh, is how we handle unique values. So each entry which is you can think of as an object. So every object is sort of is an entry in that, uh, in that hierarchical database. Um, they have two different identifiers. One is called an RDN, which let me show you here. So uh, one is called an RDN, which is a relative distinguished name. And then you would also list a parent distinguished name. So an RDN, you basically, when you create the object, you have to pick, when you create a class of an object, you have to pick what is it about that object that uniquely can identify it. So for example, you might say that a person's name uniquely identifies a person name. So in, this, in that case, the RDN would be um, person name equals, and then whatever the name is. That would be the RDN. And that's the syntax, by the way, when you reference these objects. You would say uh, the, the, the relative distinguished name would be something equals, you know, attribute equals value. And that's the, uh, and that's the syntax. Um, but as you can guess, the, the person's name is probably not going to be always unique. So you might have to add something to that to make it unique. So it does allow you to use composite keys in, in an LDAP database. So for example, I might have person name along with the person's date of birth. So maybe the combination of those two I decide is going to make them unique. Now, as we all know, that's probably not a really a great way to do that. And if you think about it on our networks, what's most commonly unique about a person is their user ID, right? Their username. So for example, mine at Drexel is BCG28. So I might be UID or you know user ID equals BCG28, for example, would be my RDN. RDNs, uh, so an entry not only has a unique identifier for the entry itself, but it also has a parent. And that's another really important concept in LDAP. So in a relational database, you have tables that are related to other tables in a traditional relational database. But in LDAP, we don't have tables. We have these objects that are related to other objects. So objects always have a parent. And you're going to see what I'm talking about here in just a second. I'm going to show you at the bottom an example of that, an object that has a parent. And if you look to the right, um, that schema where we have the name and the values, that is always defined in a schema. Um, and it's called an object class. So every. Um, Every object or entry you create, you have to tell the database or you have to identify what its object class is. In other words, you're telling it, what kind of object is this? So for example, there might be an object class for person or a computer or a printer and so forth and so on for different types of objects or different classes of objects on your network. And you can also have nested ones. 
So for example, if I have an object class of person, they may always have a name, a user ID, and a sex. But then there could also be a subclass of that object class called student, which includes also the major, the rank, and the start date. I could also have one that I don't show here, but I may also have a subclass of person called faculty, another one called staff, and so forth and so on. And you can kind of get a sense that all people have a name, a user ID, and a sex, but students have some special information that faculty may not have, and staff have information that maybe faculty doesn't have or students don't have. So, um, so they inherit those, that object class to students. So if I define an object with, a, uh, with an object class of student, then implicitly it also contains the requirements of a person as well. So for example, if I were creating an entry for a student, I would have to have a name, a user ID, a sex, a major, a rank, and a start date. All of those things would have to be in that object or defined within that object. So let's take a look at a real world example. And of course, this isn't how you would do it in LDAP, but I just wanna show you a conceptual example here. Let's say I've got Drexel, which is the root uh, object. So you always have an LDAP, you always have a root object or a base object. Uh, so the base object in this case is Drexel, and I call it C for college. So college equals Drexel, for example. And under Drexel, I might have a location called China. And within the China location, I might have a department of College of Computing and Informatics. And within that department, I might have faculty, and I might also have students and so forth. But within faculty, perhaps I've got Kim, which is a faculty member. Each one of those attributes I have determined is probably something that uniquely identifies. In other words, the division might be China, the department is CCI. So those would be RDNs that uniquely identify those. Now, let's take a different example, and, and I'll show you kind of the syntax with LDAP. So let's say I've got my location equals Philadelphia. So L equals Phila, the department equals CCI, the OU equals student, and the CN equals Sarah. Each one of those you see in the box would be the relative distinguished name. But now let's take a look at how we would create the, the actual distinguished name. So the actual distinguished name you can think of uh, sort of like addressing a letter. When you address a letter, you always start with the most, um, the most specific piece of information. So for example, if I were gonna send the letter to Sarah, I would start with her name. Then I would say she's at Drexel University. Uh, Market Street would be her address, you know, the street that she's on, and then Philadelphia, PA. So I started very specific with Sarah at Drexel University. Then I got, I widened it to Market Street, and I widened that to Philadelphia, PA. We use a similar structure when we do LDAP. So we start with the most specific. So for Sarah, her distinguished name would be CN equals Sarah, OU equals student, D equals CCI, L equals Phila, C equals Drexel, and then I could even have um, uh, DC equals edu, for example, since it's drexel.edu as an example. Of course, that would be more of a real example. But I want to show you conceptually here you know, how this works. So if I were going to look inside her entry, her parent object would be OU equals student, D equals CCI, L equals Phila, C equals Drexel, where her RDN is CN equals Sarah. I could determine what her DN is implicitly by concatenating all those together. So if I concatenate her RDN to the parent DN, then I would have her full distinguished name or DN. And the important thing about the DN is it not only tells me who she, what her object is, but it tells me where she is in relation in the hierarchical structure to the other objects. So by tracing all of these distinguished names throughout the entire database, you could build a hierarchical map of how everything relates to something else. So, and just to review, inside the Sarah entry, so in that entry, you would, have, uh, the, uh, you would have the major, the rank, the start date, and because that's a subclass of person, she would also have a name, a user ID, and a sex. So when I look inside her entry, I would see all of those things. So let's just talk a little bit about the LDAP vernacular. I've used some terms, but I'm gonna formally ident uh, uh, tell you about those terms here. So a directory server is LDAP itself. An entry is a single object in LDAP. So each entry has attributes, right? We talked about attributes, and that's all defined in a schema. A, a schema is what defines what we can find in an entry. What are the valid um, data points or metadata that we could have about a particular object? That's what a schema is. 
If you've taken any Active Directory classes, they talk about schema in there as well. An object class is really how we, what we, def how we define a schema in LDAP. So the object class is really the schema for LDAP. An RDN, as I talked about before, is the unique ID for an entry. And a DN is its distinguished name. Uh, so in DNS, this might be the parts of an FQDN. So we also talk about distinguished names with, uh, with uh, DNS as well, when we do lookups with things like Active Directory and LDAP. DSC and uh, DC, this is the root entry or that base entry. So in my example previously, it was Drexel, uh, and it would look like this, DC equals Drexel, comma, DC equals EDU for Drexel.edu. Those are the, just the different parts of the URI. And finally, LDIF, which is kind of important. Um, LDIF is, is kind of hard to get in the beginning, but um, I'll try to explain it to you. So it, it's basically the standard query language used for LDAP. So if we're going to submit a query to an LDAP server, that query has to be in the LDIF format, right? So we create, um, we, we construct our query in the LDIF uh, syntax, and we send it to the query. And the response that we get back that shows us information about the nodes or the entries that we're looking for also is in the LDIF format, which we can then parse. So it's just a standard format. You can think of it kind of like XML, right? So XML is a, uh, is a standard format or a syntax. So LDAP has its own syntax. You could also think of this like SQL if you've taken a database class and you've had to write SQL queries. For example, select star from table name is a query in SQL. This is the same kind of thing, but, it, but it's just a different query language. LDAP is its own language. It doesn't really use uh, the syntax that you might find in SQL, but the concept is very similar. It's a database, just like Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle or PostGear or something like that. All right, so to install LDAP, uh, you're going to require the Open LDAP Clients package and the Open LDAP Server package. Um, you're going to configure your firewall on port 389 if you're not using uh, secure, or 636 if you're going to be using encryption. Uh, for the lab environment, we don't need to use the encryption, but you can certainly set that up if you like. Um, so if you are going to leave your firewall on in the lab environment, be sure to open up port 389, which uh, should identified, be identified as LDAP in, your, uh, in the firewall, in the system config firewall. All right, so once you have those two packages, um, you're now ready to configure your LDAP server. So in the example, we're going to use brillserve.com as an example. So you're going to rename ldap.config. So use this command to rename that. So you're basically, you're going to use the move command, or MV, uh, to rename that file. Then you're going to change into the configuration directory. So use the cd command to change into the config directory for LDAP. Next, if you need to use encryption, you would have to obtain your encrypted password by running the slap passwd command. It's basically going to ask you for whatever you want your password to be, and it'll output a hash. And that hash is going to have to be stored in the, uh, in the LDAP configuration as the uh, password. But if you're not going to use encryption, which we're not in this particular lab, you don't need to do this step. So you can skip this step for now. So. First, we have to go into the uh, OLC database configuration file. So you'll find the OLC database one uh, bdb.ldiff file. And in that config file, uh, you'll see the option, colon, and then a value. So the OLC suffix, in this case, we're going to make it brillserve.com. So it's dc equals brillserve, uh, comma, dc equals com. Then we have to set the OLC. By the way, it shouldn't be OLD. It's going to be OLC root distinguished name. So the root distinguished name is going to be um, basically the root user that is, so we're creating a root user that's allowed to query, add, modify, and so forth. So this would be like in a, in a database service, this would be the user that's allowed to pretty much do anything they want with the database. Um, so you have to, you're basically configuring a user here. And the user is, you can think of it this way, this user is ldapadmin at brillserve.com. But we use the distinguish name format. So it's CN equals LDAP admin, comma, DC equals brillserve, comma, DC equals com. But again, you can think of it as LDAP at brillserve.com. Next, you have to set the password. Um, in the example, we're just going to use porcupine. But you could use anything you like if you want to set it to 
uh, armadillo, you could certainly do that or whatever, whatever animal you prefer, but just make sure you remember what you put in there when you start doing your lab. We're not storing it as encrypted, so you could always go look at it later. But in the real world, we would probably use slap password to make it encrypted. And whenever we interact with LDAP, we would use the encrypted password or we would encrypt the password. All right, when you're done, you're going to edit the OLC uh, database to monitor.ldiff file. Uh, and you're just going to run, um, you're just going to put this into that file. So, uh, and basically you're setting the base, um, the base to brillserve.com. So that will be the base uh, entry. So this would be a good time to pause the video and go ahead and make those changes. Uh, so again, you're going to you're going to move that file. You're going to change into the config directory, and it's an in the Etsy directory, just like everything else that we do when we install services. You don't have to do the slash password command because we're just going to use plain text. And then you want to change your LC database file, both the uh, bdb.ldiff file and your monitor.ldiff file. Presumably, you've completed those steps, so now you're ready to test your LDAP server. So, like anything else, our first step is going to be to start the server or restart if it was already running. You can either use the service CTL command to do that, or you can use the service command, which we've used throughout the semester. So, to query your server, um, so we're going to have to query it manually. I'm going to talk about in a few minutes how to do this with other tools a little bit easier. Um, but we can use the LDAP search command to do a query against our server. So, LDAP search allows you to do queries. The dash X means use simple authentication. Otherwise, you would have to use your, uh, you would have to have had your hash in the config file. But since our config file does not have a hash in it, instead it just has a plain text password, we use the dash X, which tells it that we're not using encrypted passwords. So it's using simple authentication mode. The dash S base is telling it what the base, uh, that we're looking up the base object. So this is saying uh, you're doing a query for the base object. Um, and then the naming context, is basically the DSC that we configured earlier. So when we saved that DSC uh, earlier, when we when we edited that file, the LDIF file, um, we should get a response back from the server. So go ahead and run that command. This would be a good time to pause. Run the LDAP search dash x dash s base uh, naming context command, and you should get back uh, the uh, the LDIF file that we created earlier. That'll show you some information. So assuming your LDAP search command worked, um, we can now try adding a new entry to our LDAP server. So uh, if LDAP search worked, you're able to query your LDAP server. Now you want to try to modify or add a new entry to your LDAP server. So just like in a database engine like SQL Server or Oracle or something like that, where you get insert records and, and update records, we can do something similar with LDAP uh, using uh, the LDIF syntax. So Using LDAP modify, it's a different command. We are going to pass in a file. So first step is you have to use VI to create a file with the following lines. The first line is going to be a DN. In this case, uh, DC equals Brill serve, DC equals com. Then you're going to do a change type add. So you're going to add a record with that DN, with that parent DN, I should say. So the DN is the parent DN. Uh, the DC is going to be Brill serve. And then the object class is going to be DC object. You're also going to use an object class of organization. And we're going to set the organization name to Zbrill Associates Incorporated. So we're creating a new entry called uh, uh, Brill Serve, and its organization name is going to be Zbrill Associates. And that's going to be uh, in the hierarchical structure, that's going to be under the brillserve.com underneath the base object. So to run that, uh, or to, to actually modify using that LDIF file that we just created. So when you save that file with VI, make sure you remember what the file name is. Uh, save it somewhere where you know where it is. And then we're going to run LDAP modify dash X. The dash X is the same as before. Uh, this is so we use plain, um, or I'm sorry, simple authentication mode instead of encrypted. Um, the, uh, the D uh, is where we pass in the username. So the root username in this case. So if you recall, we set it up as LDAP admin. So, and like I said before, normally you would do something, uh, you know, an authentication that most of us are familiar with. We might have something like LDAP admin at brillserve.com. But in LDAP, we write it as CN equals LDAP admin, comma, DC equals brillserve, comma, DC equals com. 
So all of that inside the quotation marks is really our username. The dash W means we're passing in the password. If you made that a capital W, instead of passing in the password, it would prompt you to type it in after you type after you run the command. Uh, so that obviously would be a little bit more secure because you wouldn't see the password in the command itself. And then the dash F is the file that we're passing in. Uh, in this case, it's whatever you called it dot LDIF. Um, well, uh, presumably you called it something dot LDIF. If you didn't call it dot LDIF, it's okay. It'll, it should still work. But, um, but that's where we're going to pass in the name of the file that we want to add. So once you do that, you should, it should add that record to your LDAP. So go ahead and run that command. So you're going to create that file using uh, VI and then run the command as I show you here on the screen. And this would be a good time to pause and try that. Presumably that command would have run with, uh, with uh, no errors. And if it did, you should be able to run the slap cat command. Uh, so the cat command normally is just to show the contents of a file, right? Or we can add contents to a file. But uh, the slap cat command is going to show you your LDIF file. So it's going to show you basically the database file, all of the objects that are in your database. Um, you do have to run this as root. So I recommend using the su command first. So login is root with su. Uh, I don't believe this will work with sudo, but you can certainly try it. Uh, but I usually just use su. So you're going to type su, login. Uh, or you can use the su command to simply run the command. It's su dash c, and then uh, slap cat. And then when you hit enter, it'll prompt you for a password, just like sudo. So once you do that, um, take a look at the file that gets output and uh, make a note of the things that it added. That'd be a good thing to write about in your lab is to write about the, um, you know, obviously you know that you added the organization name, but there should be some additional things that were automatically added to that LDIF file. The LDIF file is going to contain a lot of objects if you're on a, uh, if you're on a server with a lot of objects on it. For example, it could have all of the user accounts that come back in that uh, uh, when you run Slapcat. So you could use the grep command to try to find things, but um, obviously querying LDAP is going to be a little bit easier than just looking at the entire list. But each entry is going to be separated by a space. So you'll have an entry, which will be multiple lines, and then a, uh, an empty line, and then the next entry, and then an empty line, and the next entry, and so forth and so on. Um, so that's basically the format of the output for that LDIF file or this, when you run Slapcat. All right, so everything that we just did was manually running this stuff using the commands, which is great uh, for troubleshooting. But in the real world, we're not going to want to use those commands to do everything with LDAP. That would uh, drive us crazy, right? So we want to use some utilities to do that. There's a couple different utilities you could use that your book talks about. One of them is Evolution Mail, and the other one is GQ. So you can install those packages. So if you have the graphical user interface, if you have a desktop environment, You'll be able to install either one of those or both of those. And you could try that instead of using the command line to, to, uh, to view and edit what's in LDAP. Uh, so you'll basically be able to open it up. Uh, you'll be able to add new objects. And the cool thing is you won't have to know the schema. You won't have to go look up the object class to figure out what you need to have in the LDIF file. It'll tell you what uh, fields are required. It'll actually go out and figure that out for you. And it'll give you a little form that you could fill out with all those objects. So it feels a little bit more like managing user accounts, for example, in, uh, in Windows, right? Where it just gives you a, uh, you know, a bunch of form fields that you can fill out. So, uh, so you can certainly use one of those graphical tools to play around with LDAP. Your book doesn't cover it, but I do want to talk for just a moment about um, how we would use LDAP in the field. So for the most part in the field, when we use LDAP with Linux, it's usually going to be to integrate to something like Windows, right? So um, Windows has a lot of great features. Active Directory has a lot of great features. It's very useful. And one of the really useful things about Active Directory is going to be things like group policy, right? And without Active Directory, we don't have group policy. So, um, you know, and, and, and is, this is a Linux class, of course, and, you know, we all love Linux, but, but we know in the field, Windows is much more common on the desktop environment. You know, we, we don't give users, uh, typical users, a Linux desktop, right? There's a lot of tools and things that people are used to that run in Windows. So by and large, we use Windows workstations. So um, it goes without saying that we're going to probably have Active Directory for the most part in corporate networks. And that said, there is a place for Linux. There are a lot of things that Linux is used for. Um, Linux is a great platform for, uh, for all kinds of 
application servers. We've, we've talked about a whole bunch in this class, like Apache and DNS, uh, email. You know, all these things can be run from Linux, and they're all very reliable in Linux. Um, you know, Linux has a lot of great features. It's one of the most popular web servers on the planet. Uh, Oracle, for example, is a really powerful database engine, and it runs very well in Linux. So a lot of folks use that uh, rather than Windows. So lots of good reasons to run Linux, but we don't want to silo our Linux systems where they have to maintain their own user accounts and passwords and things like that. Uh, most people want to have a single sign-on environment where anytime somebody accesses any resource on the network, it's using the Active Directory as the source of truth. So we can use Active Directory as a source of truth in, in Linux or Unix if we use the LDAP client. So a lot of times we're going to install the LDAP client on a Linux system so that it can use Active Directory as its source of truth for, um, uh, for network objects and for user accounts and things like that. So a nice little tutorial for that, if you want to take a look at that. Um, this one's pretty good. Uh, it's wiki.archlinux.org. It's a different distribution of Linux, but it's still Red Hat based. But take a look at that. Um, that shows you how to set up LDAP authentication in, uh, in Linux. So basically setting up your Linux server to use LDAP. If you still have, or if you're in a class currently where you're learning about Active Directory in a Microsoft Windows Server, you could set up your Microsoft Windows Server Active Directory to use LDAP. So you can enable LDAP in Active Directory and then use your Linux machine for this class. And you could set it up using that tutorial to use um, uh, Active Directory, to use the LDAP services available in Active Directory for authentication. So there'd be a nice sort of crossover lab that you could do between both classes so you could see how Linux and Windows can work together on the same network. And of course, Microsoft is, is happy to help that work because um, you know, they certainly want people to use Active Directory and, and that's just another feature. So take a look at that if you want to do something uh, a little bit extra. But if you have any questions, let me know and thank you for watching.